Welcome back to Computer Networks, and we're going to have a look now at Chapter 4, Advanced Internetworking. And let me get the right thing there. For, oh, hang on. I'm a oh, there we go. That's better. Okay. So, yep, cool. So, there's three problems that we're trying to address here uh, with advanced internetworking. Um, one is actually just how do we scale things up, right? I mean, this is this was a, a big problem in the, the 1990s as the internet was growing explosively, faster, in fact, than Moore's law was growing the capacity of uh, switching hardware uh, to keep up with that growth. So, you know, we now have a system that has billions and billions of N nodes uh, and hundreds of thousands of networks. And yeah, how, how do we get to this point where this can work and how do we sustain this? Uh, there was also a, uh, a problem in that the IPv4 address space is only about 4 billion addresses. There is more than 4 billion people on the planet. Uh, and there's more, certainly more than 4 billion mobile phones and devices that all want to be connected to the internet uh, around now. So how can we address this? And are there any other kind of things that we can improve in the way that the internet works uh, to make life a little bit nicer uh, for things and make it easier for uh, network administrators and network constructors uh, to do their job. So we'll have a look at four things in this chapter. Uh, the global internet, uh, multicast uh, communication, uh, multi-protocol label switching, and mobile IP. So let's... Uh, and I guess really what we are trying to look at here is, in fact, how do we do internetworking on a global internet scale as we know it today. And how does this work? Uh, we want to talk about IPv6 and the role that that has uh, in that. Uh, and a little bit of discussion actually about how IPv6 hasn't yet dominated uh, and some reasons around that. Uh, and then have to have a little bit of a, a think as well and have some awareness around the evolution of how the internet has changed and the functionality it can provide. So. You know, mobility with mobile phones now is much more important than it was 20 years ago uh, or 30 years ago. Uh, multicast now gets used differently uh, than it was. And traffic engineering, how we can you know, engineer these network systems to sustain the traffic and uh, to get the quality of service that we need around traffic. And then finally, VPNs, virtual private networks, uh, and the kind of role that they've played as well. So... If we go right back uh, to about 1990, uh, this is basically what the internet looked like. Uh, there was the National Science Foundation in the United States. They had their network backbone. Uh, and then there were uh, these three regional uh, hubs from that that then went out to individual universities and institutes and things. It was really quite small and quite manageable equipment. There's other ones that we haven't shown in here, but you kind of get the idea. It was a fairly small, manageable uh, kind of thing uh, and as it's kind of grown uh, and now we have a larger backbone things have got a little bit more sophisticated as that process has gone on so you have the backbone service providers who are kind of connecting a lot of these large entities together and many large corporations will connect to more than one backbone for redundancy uh, they will tend to peer with each other um, in different uh, locations so it literally means that they actually their networks come together with switching and routing gear so that data can kind of take the shortest path to get through. And, and so these, if you like, are the wholesale or industrial scale internet service providers. So large corporations might connect directly to them, but smaller companies will typically connect through some kind of consumer ISP um, or retail ISP to get their connectivity. And so to make all of this work, we have to be able to route between these different organizations and entities on the internet. So we have interdomain routing with border gateway protocol, BGP, which thinks about the internet as a bunch of autonomous systems, which are given the, uh, uh, the shorthand of an AS, each of which is under a single entity's administrative control. So that means that all of the address allocations that might exist in that network uh, are under the control of one entity. Uh, and that that one entity has that authority to say where they're accessible on the internet and the like. Uh, and so it typically corresponds to uh, an administrative 
uh, you know, a domain of administrative control. So universities, companies, backbone providers, these are good examples of the kind of things that will tend to have an autonomous system number. Uh, small companies uh, and the like tend, you know, will tend not to because their networks are not uh, large enough uh, to warrant a separate AS. Uh, and so, um, again, it will be at the ISP level or a large company will have an AS. Small retail customers, including small companies, uh, will tend not to have an AS. Their ISP will have the AS, summarizing all of the ISP's routes. And so if we think then about uh, a simple system that might have uh, two autonomous systems. So the first autonomous system is R1, R2, and R3 up here. And the second one is down here. So the key is that the autonomous systems typically will have only one or very few interconnection points to uh, the rest of the internet. Uh, so that they can be seen as a bubble containing those networks. So from the outside, the internet doesn't care about the internal structure. That is only the, uh, you know, the concern of that autonomous system. And so this simplifies the global routing complexity. And so this really is the goal of this. So giving some hierarchy to allow uh, for this abstraction, this through aggregation of routing information. And that this abstraction, as with all things with abstraction, it improves the scalability uh, of this. So again, as we showed in the, the previous one, you have an internal routing problem, which is much simpler, which the autonomous system looks after. And then it's only the connection of that autonomous system to the outside world that is the concern of the global uh, routing system. So we have these two different routing domains. And indeed, routing domain is a, another uh, you know, way of, uh, of describing these things, really. Uh, and so you will then, we can think about this as a, a two layer uh, process again, as we're talking about here with the two parts. So one is intra domain. This is inside the AS and it can use whatever mechanism it likes because it's only itself that needs to know about it. But the inter domain routing protocol must be an internet wide standard for it to interoperate across uh, the entire internet. So this is where we have uh, exactly these protocols. So we have exterior gateway protocol and border gateway protocol um, as two ways of doing this inter-domain routing. Um, so EGP uses a, a, a tree-like topology on the internet, a little bit like uh, what the, uh, the spanning tree protocol did for ethernet, um, but it didn't allow for a graph structure. So where you had suddenly starting to get all of these multiple interconnections and peering points that improve the performance and scalability of the internet, EGP couldn't handle it. On the other hand, BGP was designed precisely to deal with this. So it just assumes that the internet is a bunch of ASs that have some arbitrary sets of links to other ASs uh, and, uh, and is able to handle this. And so this is what's needed for today's internet to make it perform adequately. And yeah, and so connections can be made and, uh, and broken and moved around the internet. Uh, and this will tend, you know, this, the, the whole purpose of it is that it will still keep the whole thing uh, connected. So uh, as we said with BGP, some large corporations will directly connect and have their own AS. Um, but for most companies, uh, they will actually just connect through uh, one or more service providers that will have an AS. So this will be a, a, an ISP typically. Uh, or they might have a collective. Uh, so for example, you know, a group of universities, uh, small universities might actually form their own uh, kind of arrangement where they peer to one another and then that has a, a common AS that goes out uh, to the internet via one or more points of connection. So again, with BGP, uh, if we're looking at BGP4, again, it's allowing for this arbitrary set of interconnected ASs. Local traffic is that traffic which originates uh, or terminates within the AS and transit traffic is traffic that needs to pass through the AS uh, to get to its eventual destination. So then we can think about AS as really as kind of being three kind of uh, groups in here. 
Uh, you can have a sub AS. So this is really where you just have a, a, you know, an entity, a, a business or a university that connects to the internet in exactly one place. Uh, so it will only carry local traffic uh, because there's no other way for it to go out. Uh, a multi-homed AS is one that connects to uh, more than one other AS, but is not interested in carrying transit traffic. So this will tend to be large companies. So they will connect for redundancy, but they're not interested in being part of the internet backbone. And it's the third category that, if you like, is the backbone. These are transit ASs. So they're, you know, what they're intending to do is to carry traffic uh, for other ASs to, you know, to connect them to the rest of the world. And so without that distinction, uh, if a company decided to be multi-homed, they would run the risk of having huge amounts of traffic flow through their links uh, if the internet thought that they were a shortcut uh, to get somewhere. And so BGP in doing this, in trying to connect uh, you know, networks to the, uh, the internet uh, as a whole, uh, is really about finding loop-free paths uh, that can reach everywhere on the internet. So we don't want loops because, of course, this is uh, counterproductive, um, but it's much more concerned about connectivity than it is about optimality. And so, uh, yeah, if you can find a path which is near to optimal, this is actually totally, that's a really great result, right? Um, but we don't care whether we have a completely optimal path so long as it's near enough to be optimal because uh, it's much more important that actually the connectivity is there and functions uh, the whole time because uh, that's ultimately the purpose of the internet, right? And so having the... Uh, because there are so many ASs uh, and you know, the routing graph or the, you know, the, the connectivity graph for the internet as a whole, uh, if we tried to do that optimally, would have tremendous complexity and the, the backbone routers wouldn't be able to process that as efficiently uh, as we would like. And so this would mean that the data rates would drop, uh, the uh, latency would increase, and so the internet as a whole would slow down by more than what the penalty of having the occasional suboptimal uh, route is. And so there's a, an issue of trust that really comes into all of this uh, as well. Um, in that various ASs might not wish to trust advertisements from other um, ASs. Uh, and so there's issues here where you can black hole the traffic for other networks if you were to if you like put out a, a false AS um, or a naughty government might put an AS out that's advertising to be the best way to connect to some other country so that they can actually sniff all the traffic going through for that other country. And these are things that have happened uh, in the past. So uh, the issue of trust is a significant one uh, in there. So each AS has exactly one BGP speaker that advertises the networks that it has internally and provides the reachability information to other networks if it's a transit AS. Um, and only if it's a transit AS, because otherwise it's effectively saying that you can't reach anyone via me except for my local networks. Uh, and it will give some path information that lets uh, the rest of the internet understand uh, you know, what paths should be taken. Uh, and then of course the AS will have more one or more uh, gateways uh, that are actually the routers through which uh, that AS is connected to the internet. And so, of course, it doesn't need to be the same device as the BGP speaker, but you might purposely want to have those uh, quite separate. So what's interesting is that BGP is neither a distance vector nor a link state routing protocol. Um, what it does instead, it advertises complete paths um, as lists of ASs to reach particular networks. Uh, so that other networks can use that information to make informed decisions as they generate and maintain their routing tables. Uh, so we could, for example, have a, a network like this uh, running BGP. So the backbone network is the network through which all of the most distant traffic is needing to go. Uh, and each individual customer will advertise a set of networks that are internal to it. And so it will route for those individually and it will advertise out saying, hey, my local networks are these um, to the regional provider. Uh, the regional provider will also be announcing uh, transit services to get to these 
to the whole rest of the internet and vice versa. Uh, and again, we will have another customer that might be connected to that same provider. And so this will have to make the routing decisions as to which way traffic needs to go uh, to get to any of the ASs. And so in that sense, it's kind of, it's the same for all of these non-stub ones, which are forming the, uh, the regional or backbone networks. They need to know which way to get to each AS. Whereas the stubs know that everything they want to get to that isn't local is out over the link to their uh, providers. So in this case, um, so AS2 will advertise the reachability for P and Q. So AS2 is here advertising the reachability for P and Q. Uh, and it will list the set of networks that are available uh, directly from AS2. So they're the ones that are in P and Q. Uh, the backbone will then advertise all of these and so that they can be reached along the path uh, AS1, AS2. So it's saying that it's via itself and then through AS2 to get to those uh, endpoints. Uh, and so we provide, as I said, that complete path information and the speaker can, of course, cancel uh, advertised links so that if a link goes down, for example, that this can be uh, correctly handled. So... The AS numbers obviously need to be unique in BGP. Um, and they all have to identify themselves in the same way. Uh, and so for this reason, AS numbers are allocated by a central authority and they're only 16 bits. So there can only be 65,536 ASs globally. Uh, so this kind of enforces some of that hierarchy to make sure that the global routing uh, domain stays manageable. Okay, and we'll stop there and continue in a moment.